Good morning, everybody. Hello and welcome to the Open Online Briefing today. And thank you for joining. It's lovely to see people who are normally with us and also people who are new in the, in the briefing series. Uh, what we usually do in these briefings is to do a, a, a topical analysis of what's happening uh, in the COVID world. And then we discuss amongst ourselves how we can together contribute to making it work well. And um, today, what I want to do is to focus on some of the things that have been particularly coming to my attention over the last three days, and also to look ahead uh, and to look at how we together ourselves can help make the situation improve. My own, my, thank you, my own effort has been focused on what I call getting real, getting real about what good COVID responses mean in practice, getting real about working together to actually advance these responses and getting real about the international mechanisms that we have. And, and the reason why I'm, I'm trying to shift a bit to really uh, alerting people to the situation is as follows. Number one, uh, our, our COVID pandemic is continuing to advance around the world. It's not declining. Uh, and in fact, in some parts of the world, uh, numbers of people with COVID are quite clearly rising. Uh, the virus hasn't changed. Uh, there are certain differences in the distribution of people and all that stuff, but the virus hasn't changed. And yet numbers of cases are going up. Uh, uh, numbers of cases going up. What does this mean? Let's get real about the meaning. And then let's get real about the responding. What are the things that really, really matter out of all the different uh, things that we're looking at? And let's get real about the institutions that we have, that we're working with, uh, in order to make certain they work for the best. Uh, what I'm doing is taking advantage now of more and more opportunities to talk with governments, uh, to talk with local authorities, talk with businesses, uh, civil society, labour unions and more about how they interpret the present situation. And it's not an easy situation to describe. I'm going to try it with you now uh, and then get your reactions uh, because I'm seeking to really make a difference on the advocacy uh, both uh, in Europe uh, and also in uh, different other different parts of the world, getting real. But before we go in, I'd like to welcome Chris Shipton, uh, um, who um, uh, has, is our artist. Uh, he's just there. You can probably see him on your screen. Chris, thank you for joining us. Uh, you straight away put getting real at the top of your uh, design board. And we'll, in a minute, we will invite you when you've got going to tell us how you're getting on. Now, I wanted to, uh, to thank also Carlotta. Carlotta, I can't read your surname. I don't know whether you're on here today. Uh, Carlotta has been done a drawing from the recording of last week, because you remember on Friday, we did not have a visual artist. And Clark, uh, Carlotta Cat Cataldi uh, did a very nice piece of work. And I'd just like to thank her for the excellent work she did. I'd like to go now to Twee, uh, who wants, is going to talk about uh, the little survey. And um, I'm going to also encourage Twee, as we go through today, to talk about how the WhatsApp group is developing. And then please make certain that you put into the chat if you would like to talk and make a comment today so that we can make certain we come to you quickly. And I welcome back. Fawzia Rashid, it's always lovely when you're on, Fawzia, from the Aga Khan Development Network. And uh, I will, Fawzia, ask you to give you your latest sense of things after I've done my little getting real introduction. Uh, I'd like to hear what's coming in from the Aga Khan teams around the world that you've been able to pick up on. It'd be really, really helpful to us. Uh, let's go to Twee. Thank you, David. So you will have seen that the poll has popped up on your screen and I can see some of you are already uh, uh, responding to question one, which is where are you joining from? Once you've done that, you can scroll down, select your age range. And so far, uh, the winning age range is under 30. We've got four of you responded from the under 30 age range. 
And then the last question there is, how are you feeling today? We've got more positive emotions along the top, uh, negative emotions along the bottom. Uh, and you are invited to select more than one if you feel uh, a range of emotions, which we often do at this time. Uh, I'll keep the poll open and we'll come back to it later in the briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Twee. So uh, uh, let's just start by um, thinking a bit about what this virus is doing. Uh, in our meetings, always, we say, remember, the virus is the threat. And you can even say, if you want to, the virus is the enemy. And people are the solution. And the role of authorities, be they in government, local, business, professional organizations, media, who are in some places quite authoritarian, the role of authorities is to help to ensure that people are enabled to respond in the best way possible. So, what's actually happening? Well, in Europe at the moment, the speed with which the number of reported cases is doubling is currently around seven or eight days. It depends in which part of Europe you are, and it all depends a bit on the testing policy of the place where you are. But we're not seeing a rapidity of rise in the numbers of people reportedly having COVID in Europe that we saw in March and April last year. Now, if that's the reality, then there is no doubt in my judgment that the precautions that people are taking generally are actually reducing the risk of spread. And that was what many of us have been hoping for as public start to make sense of this virus. And we'll keep going, we just keep, keep going with what we call the all in precautions. If you want to go all in, you mask rigorously, you maintain physical distance, you practice hygiene as well as you can, hands, coughing, and clean, clean surfaces, and you stay out the way if you're sick. Some can add on to it, like adding on protecting the vulnerable. And I think that probably is also quite important. Okay, so it's important that we look at each other and say, it's quite clear that something is happening. And it, it, it's not universal. And there are some people who find it very hard to do. There are some people, an anti-group that say, we're not gonna do it. But overall, I believe there's evidence in Europe and I actually think in many other parts of the world that there is a gradual adoption of these behaviours. And I think we have to be positive about it. On the UK Sky News last night, I was pushed again. You know, are you depressed about the fact that numbers are going up and there are reports that people are not protecting and, and I compare it with my own experience, my family's experience, my friend's experience, what I see around me and what I reports I hear, it's just not true that nobody's doing it. It's just not everybody, not everybody. It wants to do it, not everybody can do it, but still there's an awful lot of adoption of these precautions. And so I think it's, it's a really important requirement to credit that. But there's another thing that we need, I think, to push that perhaps is still not being done. And that is a real sense on the part of individuals everywhere that they're doing this because they want to do it. They're doing it because it's what matters to get ahead of this virus rather than they're doing it because they've been instructed to do it by a government or other authority. So the all-in precautions 
I think there's evidence that they are being adopted, but there's also an anxiety on my part that they're perhaps being adopted because people are told to do it rather than because people want to do it. So the goal, as far as I'm concerned, is increasing in the extent to which people feel that they are part of the solution, that they are working together with others on this solution and contributing to it. When we were discussing yesterday with our colleagues in Singapore and listening to their report, it was a very, very interesting seminar from the Singapore team that uh, I was able to join. The sense there that came over more and more and more strongly from the director of, of health services for Singapore and also relating to analogs from China and other parts of East Asia, their point was, our people are doing this because they want to do it. Our people are doing this because they feel this is the way to have a secure future. And so I really, really, really want to uh, ask you all to keep thinking about what is the possibility for enabling public in different parts of the world to actually feel that this is what they want to do rather than what they are being compelled to do. Now, I've been thinking further, well, what does that mean in practice? If we really want to use whatever positions we have to actually help people own and feel good about the response and not feel that they're doing it because they're told to, what can we do? Well, we've been saying for some time that the easiest way to try to help people feel responsible is to move the epicenter of COVID response to the local level. And I think that's one of the steps that's needed, but there's also quite an important feature, which is the mindset of the local actors. And I, I, I really want to share with you, I, I spoke with the, the chair of a local authority in a northern British city yesterday. At the same time, I was communicating with the advisors to the First Minister of Scotland yesterday, as well as with the Minister of Health of Canada. And in each of these conversations, there's a most interesting new flavour came into the discussion. How might we enable the people of our cities or of our countries to actually be in charge and to feel that they're in charge? That was the question in the discussion. And there was a real sense in all three of the interactions that there are things that political leaders can do that will give power to local actors. So here's one of the issues. What to do about the hospitality sector, restaurants, public houses, and places where people gather. Do you simply say, close at 10 p.m., restrict to no more than six people in a, in a, in a gathering? Or do you bring them in and have an open meeting and say, well, here's the problem. We've got a rising incidence level. We know that there are clusters building up that are linked to hospitality. Okay, you owners of these hospitality businesses, what's your solution? So you actually hand the issue over to them. 
And it was a very, very interesting discussion yesterday because quite a lot of these local leaders want to do that, but are scared that there's going to be pressure, new regulations coming from some higher place or new anti-regulations coming, some tweet coming from across the Atlantic that's going to knock things for six. And so they want to maintain the more authoritarian stance because that's the easier thing to do, it's the quicker thing to do, it's the one that can get the headlines. But a lot of those working at local level, both political actors and the officials, you know, the heads of the council, the heads of public health and so on, were telling me, we need just a little bit of time. We need time to bring the people together and share the problem with them. And in one case, I was hearing, well, they've actually shown that this local engagement mechanism works because they'd managed to keep the number of cases in their care homes in their city absolutely static for two weeks, which is an amazing thing if it's true, and I think it probably is. And so they're showing that this local empowerment system works, but they find it very difficult to communicate that they're actually working back to national government. And national government is a bit scared that the numbers are going up and wants to come out with new top-down restrictions on numbers of people who can gather together in houses and so on. And so it's really difficult to get that integrated local level gap coming together and empowerment when the centre is saying, we're worried, numbers are going up, worried that we're going to have overcrowded hospitals in two months' time, we must come down hard. And you can feel it. You can feel the anxiety on the part of the national bosses. And at the same time, you can feel that sense of desperation on the part of the local leaders saying, please give us a bit of time just to bring the local actors together so that we can work out what to do with it. Gosh, I found it acute yesterday. I found it really acute. I've seen it before on other health issues, that blend between driving it from the top with a strong program with clear rules and linking money to results versus working with local groups and helping them build up capacity. And I know the, the conflict, because some say if you leave it to the local areas to do it, you get very varied behavior, you get a postcode lottery with certain approaches in one place and other approaches in other places. And you know, I, I felt that tension. We had it in all sorts of issues in public health over the last 30 years. And here it was, that same stuff that we were dealing with, for example, in India or in Nepal when I was working there, and in East Africa when I was working there, Suddenly, there it is acute in Scotland, in North of England, in Canada, in Singapore. You know, this suddenly the things that we'd been working on in development and would spend ages arguing about are staring us in the face and are very acute right now. And in the end, it has to be a blend between the two. It's never either or in the kind of work we do. Of course, you need the central strategic envelope. Here it is the, the basic elements of what we want you to do. But you do need to have that local empowerment and engagement. And as we found, as I've told you before, in working on Ebola in West Africa in 2014, it's actually being ready to hand over the ownership of what's going to happen to local actors so that they can say, well, we did it ourselves. Anyway, here we are, dealing with that age-old challenge of centralised control, sorry to pretend with that strong voice, and decentralised empowerment. And of course, it's a bit of both. And of course, governance of dealing with difficult issues is about both and. and and just really to complete the three layered cake you need local action and empowerment national government oversight surveillance strategic elements coming through with the principles there but you also need experience sharing internationally and somebody was saying to me yesterday 
It's like we're in the middle of a big global experiment where all of us are playing our part and all of us are learning. And we really need to have a good open platform at the international level where the specialists can meet together safely and say, aha, here, they use that approach. There they use the other approach. In Australia, it was like this. Singapore like that and Vietnam and where you can compare approaches without feeling that each time you say what's being done, you're going to get wah, hammered because some political actor is, is using you. Here am I still uh, one month in after being totally misrepresented following an interview with a particular radio station in New Zealand, still, still being asked to come out for a third time to collect, correct the record about what I said or didn't say about Sweden, because my words are being used and, and reused and reused, and they're not even my real words, they're some misrepresentation of my words in a dispute about the Swedish strategy. And, it, and the anger and intensity in that is so great. So I was thinking how hard it is at the moment to get good international cooperation, how hard it is to run really open discussions like what we're doing here, because so quickly they get caught up in politics. I mean, I think we're very lucky in these briefings that we do that they don't suddenly get attacked and then written up in uh, media as an example of favoring one or other political position. I'm sure one day it'll happen because everything is so intense. In the US, everything is in every single issue to do with coronavirus is now being incorporated into the electoral discourse, whether it's all this stuff about vaccines or stuff about mask wearing, stuff about distancing, and it is quite incredible. And so if you've got that tension in one country, you've actually got tension in a lot of other countries, creating that third layer, which is the uh, uh, safe space where people can talk about what's going on is getting more and more difficult because in every single location, COVID is getting politicized. And it's no good us saying don't do it, it's happening. And we have to learn to live with it. So. Those are my three layers of what I call getting real that we were working on yesterday, the team was working on. Thank you, Catherine. She's the uh, person who helped think it through. <sighs> getting real local, getting real national, and getting real global, and allowing our appreciation of the political tensions associated with local working, national working, and global working allowing that appreciation to be there, working with it, not getting angry about it, but finding ways to be inside it. And of course, if you play in there, periodically you get a scrape, periodically something goes wrong, periodically you're going to get really angry tweets. And I've noticed the vitriol in the uh, in the reactions to tweets that is really coming up with people writing incredibly abusive remarks. Uh, I get a tiny bit of it. Hans Kluger, the head of WHO Europe, gets an awful lot of it. Tedros gets it. Automated of really unpleasant stuff. They've now done an analysis of it, analysis of it to show that it is totally orchestrated, the campaign to present Tedros as a murderer and all that stuff. And I was, I was talking with his chief of communications yesterday, you know, how do we help the guy? It just must be terrible to get wake up in the morning and just see this abuse, 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 abuse. And you can't insulate yourself from it, from it completely. And the head of WHO Com said, well, yeah, you know, we must recognize that every human being suffering constant drip of vilification and foul abuse and death threats and so on uh, that actually they do get hit by that. So as well as dealing with the actual politics that's operating at every level, uh, we also have to deal with the fact that, particularly for those of us who are sort of, we're primarily technicians, but we want to do politics because we think it helps us to achieve our ends. Uh, we also do occasionally feel a bit um, squeezed by it. We pretend we don't, but we do. And, uh, and I very much 
thinking about that as well. I'm sure each one of you, because you're all acting politically as you try to advance public health and equity, you're all having to deal with this kind of stuff. And um, it's interesting, in, in 4SD, we spend quite a lot of time supporting each other because we know that each one of us is vulnerable and we have to be able to work with and live through that vulnerability and continue to be the ambitious, authentic, audacious and accountable people that we are in our efforts to do systems leadership. So there you go, three areas of getting real, local, national and global. So a lot of what we're doing in 4SD right now is trying to be explicit about these issues, to have conversations with people, to accompany decision makers as they're doing really tough stuff. And, and with Twee and Derek and others, uh, we thought a good way to do this is through short videos. And Derek's team have prepared three short videos. They've also worked with Nazim and Vicky on finding ways to bring Nazim's music in as well. And we've increased uh, our engagement with Nazim, especially as we find his songs are proving to be so useful. So it's a time to really give thanks to, to these good people uh, because everything is about communications and connecting. We have the privilege of being able to connect each, twice a week and we have become quite a strong group, but linked to us are a whole series of networks doing brilliance. And this video series that has been produced, the short ones that are shown at the beginning of our uh, open online briefings, it's really wonderful how it's, it's been translated. So our colleague, Stephanie, who came on a 4SD immersion, Stephanie Okoyo, she's translated uh, the videos into Swahili. And uh, Petronella, who is Kenyan, she looked at it with her family, the Swahili one last night, and she said, it is great. So this is a time to say to Stephanie, thank you for the Swahili translation. And all of you who are either in communities that speak Swahili or you who yourselves speak Swahili, play with them, see what you think of them. We don't very often translate our stuff into Swahili. Haruko, who joins our online briefings quite often from Tokyo, at not not nice hours for her, and who's quite modest. She, she, we sometimes wonder whether she's going to speak. And uh, Haruko, we know that you're not always wanting to talk out on, on these kinds of briefings, but you've been marvelous translating it into Japanese. We look forward hugely to hearing how your Japanese translations go down. We love to hear whether your friends are, are actually watching them and whether they find them useful. And then to Claudia, for translating into Turkish, so important. You know, Turkish spoken by Turkish people, but there are Turkish people and Turkish speakers all over Central Asia, Turkish speakers all over Western Europe. And it's so good. And then there's a lot, a lot, a lot of the uh, coronavirus in Turkey. So I think having uh, videos that talk about equity and COVID in Tur with Turkish uh, translations, super, super helpful. We can't clap very easily, though you can possibly press your reaction button. Uh, I'd like to do it. So I want to give a big, big thank you to all those who've been doing. Thank you, Anne. i uh, like to see you clapping. All those who've been doing it. This is part of what I believe to be the fellowship of this. And um, Stephanie, last time, we, we ran out of, uh, I think, internet bandwidth, frankly, to get you to comment. So you're going to be speaking first. There's another person who I asked to join, who's uh, Edmund Lee. Uh, he's from Imperial College, he's a PhD student. We had a, a meeting with um, a group of students that involved Edmund and he made a really interesting comment. And I want him to talk about this because uh, I'm gonna give him the floor in a minute. You see, to do this engagement of people at the local level, and building up that local integrated action. And also to get the relationship between central government and people at local level right. There's one 
massively important ingredient. And I'm going to get Edmund to talk about that. And so after Stephanie, we go to Edmund. And then others who want to speak, please come in. The way we do it, Edmund, thank you for joining us, is we ask people when they speak if they've got good enough bandwidth to open up their video. Uh, as, and of course, they unmute. Uh, we ask them to speak for probably about three minutes. And if there's a need to prolong the conversation, we can always do it. But if we keep it short, it gives us more time. I sometimes bring in members of the 4SD team because they're working on this continuously, but I also invite others to react. And I think that there will be a lot of interest in this issue about getting real locally, getting real nationally, and getting real globally uh, in an environment that is politically enormously contested and can be quite hurtful to individuals and groups. A lot of courage needed, a lot of audacity. So let's go to Stephanie. Let's just hope, Stephanie, here you are. Hi, David. Welcome, welcome. Lovely to see you again. Thank you, lovely to be here as always. Um, I think last time I was in a hurry, but the main point I was um, making was, uh, we had all this discussion of um, people feel that we are falling back on the SDGs yes. um, agenda and uh, all attention going to COVID. I know this is simple thinking, but this is how I've always gone about when uh, thinking about the SDG agenda and how to implement it at local level, yeah. at times regional level, is that it's all integrated. We try to put it in silos. Yeah. I think it's because how the SDGs, I'm taking it from um, somebody who's not in global issues, uh, just a normal person. Yeah. And I think that's usually the way it's important when you're relating uh, national or regional issues to a local context, it needs to be so relatable. And for me is that the SDGs and the COVID is one thing. Because when you talk of the COVID, you're talking of health issues, you're talking of food security, we're bringing in inequalities. And that's what the whole SDG agenda is about. That's the blueprint of it all, looking at all issues, environmental, climate, you look at climate change, you look at, uh, decent work. So for me, I think it's one and the same thing. The SDG agenda is well integrated into the COVID pandemic. And that's, that's what it's, this pandemic is trying to teach us. And from my own perspective as a young scientist from um, Kenya, uh, was that I think also it's been a highlight for citizens in terms of abuse of power and uh, it's just been a, uh, people are tired. It, it's been a frustrating moment of people seeing um, people exploiting uh, the vulnerable at the worst moment. So it's been also a rise of citizenship, accountability of, uh, of leaders. So uh, that also has been highlight from people like us Kenyans and, I, and I'm sure for most African countries and uh, also just the collaborations happening within African scientists and diaspora. Uh, we always claim that we are recipients of, of inventions and solutions, and it's just a good space seeing uh, brilliant minds uh, coming together to be part of the solution and creators. Sure. So that, that has been really also uh, inspiring as a scientist and yeah. somebody who's into science communication and engagement. And for the translation, sorry, I usually talk too much. I hope my three minutes are not up. Yeah, you're three <laughs> for the well gone, Stephanie, but we love hearing you. And so, and we particularly want to hear you talk about what it was like translating the videos. Off you go. So for the, for the translation of the videos, when we, uh, we did it and decided to go about it, it was not for the sake of having these videos into many uh, languages. I think the whole aspect of our discussion, getting it into local context is we should always use language as a facilitator rather than barriers. So if people do understand things in Swahili or in their mother tongue, we should do that. It is upon our responsibility of people who in the communication space and engagement space to ensure that and make, and make what is being done in this big sphere of global and international issues down trickle down to even my grandmother who can hear 
um, Swahili or whichever language that is. So for us, and it was also very challenging and seeing, okay, how are we, because Swahili is one word for English is like three words in Swahili. So it was quite challenging and we were going back and forth. With the time, but it, yeah. Yeah. How tricky it was to do these translations because you have a much smaller vocabulary in Swahili than there is in English. It's a different kind yeah. of vocabulary, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it, was, it was a challenge, but it's quite interesting people seeing, um, and Derek does not, the translate, the person editing the video did not know Swahili. Yeah. So in the process of, okay, we need to do all this timing and it was also very challenging, but very interesting and it needed a lot of collaboration. Right. Because we're not working with only Swahili speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Everybody, um, you may not all be familiar with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that was released in 2015. It is a really useful uh, plan for the future of people and the world. Uh, it's got 17 goals that cover an awful lot of different areas. And when it was developed, the developers, and these were many, many thousands of people worked on it, they said, it's not going to work if you divide it all into little slices. You've got to actually see it as an integrated totality. And so um, what we were, uh, uh, what we've been offered is a plan for the future of the world and her people. It's an indivisible plan. It's a people-centered plan. It's universal, and it can only be addressed through working together and partnership. And this was being approved by all world leaders in 2015. And it's my kind of compass for what I try to do. And I think it's the compass for us in 4SD. And what Stephanie was saying, and I think I would agree with it totally, is that actually COVID shows us why this 2030 agenda is so relevant and why we have to hold on to it. And it's relevant everywhere. It's relevant in the north of England. It's relevant in Nairobi or in uh, upcountry Kenya, in Isiolo or somewhere. And it's relevant everywhere else. And you have COVID and inequity and health and they are linked together. And you, Stephanie, as a young scientist and a leader of young scientists in Kenya, see this as making incredible sense. It makes sense to you emotionally as well as rationally. And then you say, well, of course, you don't just simply go down these paths. You have to navigate all the power games that go on. And they are there to, to actually create some quite big challenges for you, but you're not scared, although you're you're, you're quite a lot younger than me. You're going to do it. And we're together with your fellow Kenyans, you're determined to do it because you see people as the solution, not technology, but people and people using technology. That's where the science really matters in the service of the people. And uh, I suppose I love most of all when you say, when we were trying to get this uh, into our own language, we didn't just simply get out Google Translate and do an automatic translation, but we actually thought about what the words mean. And we sat in a group and we thought about how do we explain this to our parents' generation. I think it's great. And I thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing this and enabling us to feel what it meant. And I hope you'll keep talking to us and come on again from time to time. I'm just so sorry that sometimes the internet doesn't work, but really blessings to you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And I'd like to shift now uh, to Edmund because as Stephanie finished, she did talk about how, uh, you know, the relationship between people and authorities in Kenya is so important and it, it's quite delicate. Uh, and it's through looking at that relationship that everything matters. Edmund, you have the floor. You have to unmute just because otherwise it's difficult to read your lips. If you could unmute, thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, so thank you for inviting me to be here this morning, Dr. Navarro. Um, so I guess I've jotted down some notes and I'll just share with everybody about some of my thoughts. Um, 
So throughout this international public health crisis, much of the world's attention has been focused on, on a whole range of issues, really. You know, the oranges in the virus, our values, PPE, etc. One of the fundamental problems that seldom really has been discussed is the importance of trust between governments and the population they govern. So in recent months, I've come to realize that in the realm of public health, this relationship is something that we often took for granted and the underlying dynamics and context supporting and weakening it is overly simplified often and um, or simply just overlooked altogether. And especially notable example of this I've discussed briefly with Dr. Naur before is the situation in Hong Kong actually. So by and large, Hong Kong has fared comparatively well in the containment of COVID-19 so far. Um, while there is clearly a strong technical expertise on the ground, I'm growing increasingly concerned at how the uh, deterringly low levels of trust between the government and citizens may ultimately undermine its public health successes. Um, for example, a recent population-based um, testing initiative saw substantial backlash from the community as being a cover for some sort of supposed nefarious plan to mass collect the biometric data of its citizens. This was a narrative I've heard repeatedly and seen perpetuated in uh, many local media outlets, often and often indirectly condoned or just directly supported by opposition politicians. All the while, influential community leaders did little to really dispel these unfounded claims. It was clear that the lack of trust was seriously threatening to undermine sound public health guidance. And in this extremely polarized political context, um, the tools we often relied on to encourage positive engagement from the public seem much less effective. And the local leaders I would typically turn to have seemingly allowed politics to supersede the need for a coordinated response from all members of society. Um, in many ways, I felt that this phenomenon is actually even more damaging that of, let's say, QAnon in the States, as the underlying political unrest and grievances in the, in the city expressed the past year has lent legitimacy as to why some people may be resistant to cooperating with any form of authority, um, even though strictly concerning just public health. And ironically, the relatively low uh, level of cases reported in the city has only exacerbated this prioritization of politics over and a continued vigilance and sustained united public health response. So in public health, we often go to great lengths to gather the best evidence in hopes that you know, the, the evidence can speak for itself um, to inform government policies and simultaneously encourage cooperation from the community. As of the recent months, however, I'm not certain that this approach is really enough to foster the trust that is so needed these days. Yeah. In Hong Kong context, um, once again, the government has used the notion of public health to postpone elections in the city for a year, while the opposition has equally used public health as a pretext to advocate for a complete closure of all border crossings with the mainland. The public health evidence that was supposed to promote trust between governments and its people has been really misconstrued and weaponized into a means to advocate for opposing political agendas. Yeah. And our strict adherence to this mantra of letting the technical data alone guide our response has really allowed for it to be misused and to the detriment of a collective goal of ultimately overcoming this pandemic. So as a Canadian citizen who first emigrated from Hong Kong, I, I, I'm genuinely saddened by the, the lack of trust that I'm seeing these days. Yeah. And I that it is seriously threatening to undermine um, what is a reasonably containment, strategy, uh, containment of COVID-19 in the city. So. I guess I end with, with many more months in this pandemic still ahead of us and rising political unrest around the world, um, this fraught relationship between governments and its people is likely a hurdle which will be experienced worldwide at a time when public support and buy-in to a coordinated response is ever more critical. So I welcome everybody's insight as to what they think can be done about this. Okay, Edmund, thank you for coming. Remember, just a tiny bit about Edmund, he's PhD, uh, candidate at Imperial. He's a Canadian citizen in Hong Kong. Actually, are you physically in Hong Kong at the moment or are you in, in Europe? No, I'm in London right now, but um, I was born in Hong Kong, but I emigrated to Canada when I was like one, but I, I have many connections to the city because my extended family still lives there. So uh, there is a connection between what Stephanie said, particularly towards the end, and what Edmund is saying, but Edmund's taking it quite a long way further. 
and we're going to have to hold some of the things that Edmund has said. Um, first of all, he says, it, this is not just about the virus, the R value, and access to PPE. Actually getting on top of it is about people and the relationship between people and authorities, and then trust. He says, it's quite easy in this situation for our public health messaging and the behaviors that we're calling for to become polarized within ongoing political debates of the kind that's happening in Hong Kong. And that quite often you find that the different political parties, even if they don't covert, uh, overtly support this dispute, they are covertly playing the game. And I think that's a super important observation. He's also saying that public health is being weaponized in political disputes. And then he says, if my predictions are right, that we're really quite early on in this pandemic, and if my statements are right, that people are the solution, and that people have to be empowered to actually implement that solution, then he says, it's now necessary for us to think explicitly, how can you encourage trust between citizens and people at this difficult time? So Edmonds is actually posing it as a really important part of public health policy. What can you do? And actually, on this call, are quite a lot of people who are spending time thinking about this, Edmund. We're not going to be able to really go into it deep, deep. But I just want to say that Annie Feltham focuses on this a very, from a very political perspective, looking at the UK. John Atkinson focuses on this more broadly because he is really interested in how you can help to build trust inside human systems. Shamim Talukdar looks at this from a very political perspective because he's a public health doctor who actually spends a lot of his time operating in the political context in Bangladesh and so on. In fact, just about everybody here in some way or other is looking at it. So I'm going to leave it hanging. Uh, thank Edmund for coming on. And Edmund, please stay close to us. I'll go to Shamim. I'd like to go to Fawzia after Shamim. I, kind of staying with people uh, from the Delta, and then we will go on and get others involved. I see people are commenting on the chat as well. Uh, and uh, Edmund, we will keep talking about, we we'll focus on what you've said, and we will remember it. Sh Shamim, please. Welcome. Thank you, uh, uh, David. Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, uh, political commitment is important as well as uh, to focus on the most affected people. And in that perspective, we are trying to make our comments and doing the advocacies uh, to motivate the government uh, to understand the new disease dynamism and the impact of it um, by sharing the you know, uh, situation within the country, as well as prospective impact on economy. Uh, our understanding is that it's really important to generate the you know, appropriate data and shared data with the all stakeholders within the country and engaging the different you know, civil societies as well as whatever the small organization. I think that it's important to engage everybody uh, 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 for uh, this situation and whatever uh, you know, initiative taken by the government. I also feel that, you know, uh, it's important to engage the international organization and international partners uh, in terms of new technology we need to, you know, engage or invest uh, in a you know, different intervention in the local context. So knowledge, it's also important to have it from the global, you know, high class knowledge transfer at the local level or national level country like Bangladesh. 
Uh, thank you, David, you know, uh, giving me these opportunities. I think that it's a great platform to share knowledge and gather the information and try to motivate and support government to take appropriate and necessary action. Can I just add that I've known Shamin for years. Uh, he's a very active public health person in Bangladesh, and he's quite aware of and appreciative of uh, the political forces having uh, been uh, buffeted around by those. So I listened to him very, very carefully. Uh, thank you for stressing that there is value in getting knowledge uh, moved between global and local, uh, because this can be very empowering. And you talk about the importance of data. And thank you also for saying that you're not scared of engaging with political actors. To Fawzia Rashid, who is, as I've told you at the beginning, very active in the Aga Khan Development Network, just to reflect on where we are so far in this conversation. Well, thank you, David, and fascinating um, contributions from, from many here. I'm really glad I joined this morning. Um, I'm sorry, I don't always find the time. But uh, where we are right now is um, some countries are sort of at a stage of relative relief. And so I am facilitating a kind of cross-learning exercise on a number of topics. And I just, I mean, there's, there's so much coming out of it, but the one thing I just bring up and kind of to connect some dots, because there's an echo chamber here on the trust issue yes. and government relations and um, uh, you know, local versus uh, top down. One of the things that is coming up through discussions when I specifically interview the lead in, in this case, the Aga Khan um, operations, um, who deals with the government in terms of coordinating the COVID response. They narrate the whole cycle of pre-COVID, how it was, go through all of the you know, ins and outs of what happened. But one of the things that emerges through it is that there was a real test, and this is ongoing, of people with commitment and people and institutions, those who add value, those who um, prove their worth. And somehow, you know, in a very short of a space of time, because of the severity of the situation, the good have been noticed and promoted. So you know, in a government sort of national task force, or you can imagine various planning fora, there may be a younger voice who previously was not listened to, but they come up with sense and they're put in the chair. You know, this sort of thing has been going on within institutions, within coordination committees, where the dunderheads are kind of moved out. <laughs> And uh, there's been, a, you know, uh, so this is not necessarily visible outside, but these are kind of internal happenings that are very positive, I think. Um, and of course, it's giving um, recognition to those who perhaps, you know, have been working really hard, but for political reasons, never profiled, never got their chance. And um, so there's been a, a real sort of uh, move, moving of chairs. And, um, sorry. Uh, I'm, um, I'm going to have to go, <laughs> but uh, that, I'll just stop there. Perhaps next time I can tell you more. What an observation, but reading across between the different Aga Khan outfits uh, that Fawzi is connected to, she's picking up that through COVID space is emerging, uh, that leaders can, uh, new leaders can move into and be recognized in. Oh, I want to hold that one and I want to reflect on that. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, Anne Hendricks Jenkins and Yusuf Gottlieb, uh, uh, both of you have got things to say, uh, but we're going to not be able to have uh, more conversation because we've got three minutes and I really want to give a couple of other people the floor to reflect on it. So I just wonder how we can do it. And could you just unmute and just give us your three main elements? Because I think that these are very helpful. You're a bit like Fawzia, you're able to connect and interpret across different settings in your role. Anne. 
Thank you so much. Okay, I'll make this very quick. With regards to translation, it's important not just to translate things into other languages, but the other way around. I think there's so much uh, local culture, indigenous wisdom, uh, words that we don't have in English that could really inform our own thinking uh, with regards to how to come out of this in a better, more connected world. Um, the second thing is that um, with regards to how to get local people really um, engaged, we found that um, they want short-term results. They also want to be heard and included, and this is a way to sort of fast track that as um, Fazia just um, referenced to. And the third point is that this can have longer term implications and benefits, which I think is a interesting uh, way to, uh, you know, get people interested in getting more involved because the structures that are set up with regards to integrated local action um, can be used for a lot of other things in the future. And these new voices that are coming out, um, we don't want them to go away after COVID um, pandemic. So I think it's a way to help people get more involved, even if they think like they're not quite that interested in COVID per se, uh, it's their uh, involvement that's um, really beautiful. Thank you very, very, very much indeed. Wonderful. Uh, um, Yosef. You just sent a comment. Would you like to try, like Anne just did, be really, really brief, please? Yusuf, if you're still on, can't see you on my thing. Uh, may have slipped off. Thank you. Okay, John, um, you've heard it. Uh, you and I have talked about this incessantly. We were talking about it last night uh, as well. How do you react to some of the points that were made in this conversation today? I thought, I thought it was really fascinating, David, and aligned so much with what we were saying. Yeah. Um, this sense that how do we get people to feel that they own their own response? Yeah. And I was, I'm struck in particularly the last you know, comments that people have made, Anne, Annie, Ed, Fauzia, all almost saying similar things. If you replace an autocratic national government with autocratic local government, you still haven't changed the relationship with people. And when we take our time locally, because we can do this locally and we can't do it nationally, to find out who's running the football team and if they'll say the message, to find out if the local doctor will say the message, to find out if the local religious lead will say the message, whoever it is in the community who cares and who understands and who is prepared to speak, it has so much more resonance than when we do it. So a local response is not just the national response done on a tighter scale. It's an altogether different relationship with people. And there's so many people, I think, David, saying that today. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, it, what, it's so important for me. John says to me, you can't just keep presenting it as local, local, local. It's a particular empowering style of governance that's key, whether it's frankly, local or from some other level. And so in the get real construct that I used for today, I said we've got to get real about the narrative, what actually we've got to do. We've got to get real about the people that are working together. We've got to get real about the context. And I talked about local, national and global. And I think what we've learned from today's discussion is it's not just simply a formula of doing things more at the local level, which I had been rather saying for the last three or four weeks. It's also whether you build into your manner of working and governance a real wish to trust people and to enable them to be actually leading the responses and john i mean i kind of feel that you've pushed my head quite an into quite an interesting new place over the last few days and i feel that this conversation has taken it further that actually focusing on trust is absolutely vital in public health and in all of the sustainable development agenda would you agree john is that what you feel that you want certainly me to articulate in my work and my life absolutely if we can change our relationship with people then our capacity to do things takes on a new dimension and i think that's the important bit thank you
let's hold that. We'll come back to this again and again. It, I think that whether we listen to Stephanie or Edmund or Pausia or Anne or whoever we are and Shamim with his very, very uh, tight and locally specific analysis, it is about relationship with people and whether we set that up in a way that increases trust. Gosh, it matters so much. Thank you very much, everybody. Just as we close, Chris Shipton, how did you enjoy this one? Uh, yeah, I, I really found that super fascinating. Um, I went to my local hardware shop the other day and the lady there told me that COVID was a man-made virus designed to uh, keep government control of people. And I decided not to pick a fight with her on it. Um, and I think, you know, I've been struggling with like, how do you approach that question? And I think this session has answered that for me because I think it is about localism. It is about, you know, kindly taking her aside and sort of trying to explain it. So I think it's really, I've been struggling with that all week. And I think I found an answer from this <laughs> session. So thank you. Chris, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for the beautiful, beautiful pictures. John's just written, he loves it. And uh, just so, so good. Um, uh, Twee for the uh, results of the survey. And uh, by the way, Chris's picture, everybody, it'll be on the website uh, uh, later today. And feel free to print it out and stick it on your wall and uh, acknowledge Chris at all times and the rest of the group of live illustration. Beautiful, beautiful work. To Twee, please. Thank you. Uh, so great uh, attendance today. We've got people in particular happy to see people from East Asia and Pacific in, um, for the time slot that we've chosen on Friday mornings. Uh, age range, great spread, as I mentioned before, a lot of young people. And then how we're feeling today, good to see, mostly positive with some doubt, worry and blame and pessimism there. And at this point, I invite you to share how you're feeling, what you're thinking in the LinkedIn community chat that we've created. Just send me a message. I've put it in the chat. Otherwise, I'll hope to see more of you all on Tuesday. Twee, thank you. Some remarkably lovely words appearing in the chat, the sort of thing that suggests that we have all found, or that many of us have found it quite stimulating. Special shout out, of course, to uh, Edmund and to Stephanie for setting us off. Uh, with that, uh, I, I, I think we'll have to stop. Um, there are some people uh, from my wonderful family here, and I just want to acknowledge my brother William from being, for being on. Thank you very much indeed. But there I want to also greet uh, Polly and Isaac. Uh, who is in his big brother role, looking completely in control. Thank you very much indeed for being with us and joining the younger generation participating in these events. And here is Otto, who, as you can see, is still a bit of a shrimp. Uh, uh, Polly, how old is Otto today? Two weeks and a bit. Okay. Otto at two weeks and Isaac, super confident. Uh, and I hope. Uh, Hi, Otto. Hi, baby Otto. That's right. Thank you very much indeed, Polly, <laughs> Isaac, and Otto. Lovely that you're with us today. Greetings. Thank you. Uh, now I think we will tune out, and uh, it is lovely. I love the way Otto is just looking. I don't know where he's looking at, up at the light, I suppose, with that lovely way in which uh, young ones just uh, they look as though they know everything, but you're never quite sure what's going on in their heads. Mm. There we go. Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Lovely to see you. And we're going to tune out now. Uh, just greetings to Shamim. Thank you for, for sparing the time to join us and for being open. Welcome to Jan Hardacre. I haven't seen you so often on this. Georgina, thank you. Moira, nice to see you. Holly, gorgeous that you're with us again. Uh, and um, very much thanks to Sarah. Gabriella, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. And I saw you reacting to some of the points earlier. That was nice as well. La last comment is just to thanks again to Chris Shipton for his generosity and in interpreting for us. With that, uh, I'd say to you all goodbye. Please stay in